the death of Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria, one of the longest reigning monarchs in English history, passed away on the 22nd of January 1901, at the age of 81, after ruling for approximately 64 years. Her reign marked a peak in the prosperity of the British Empire, with her subjects commonly referred to as Victorians. Her death came as a shock to many, as preparations for her state funeral had not been anticipated due to the unprecedented length of her rule. Towards the end of her reign, Queen Victoria faced significant challenges and turmoil. The year 1900 was particularly distressing, marked by the strain of the Boer War and personal tragedies within her family. Her elder son, Edward the heir apparent, survived an assassination attempt, while her eldest daughter, Vicky, the Doja Empress of Germany, battled advanced breast cancer. Additionally, her son, Alfred, the Duke of Edinburgh, succumbed to throat cancer, and these losses deeply affected Victoria, who had already experienced bouts of depression, especially after the death of her husband. As Victoria's health declined, she experienced weight loss, decreased appetite and deteriorating eyesight, eventually becoming wheelchair-bound and confused. Reflecting on her declining health, she expressed sadness and resignation, acknowledging her imminent passing. Queen Victoria, once a formidable ruler of the British Empire, was now facing the end of her reign and her life with a heavy heart. Three weeks into 1901, Queen Victoria passed away at Osborne House, her residence on the Isle of Wight. Following her death, Osborne House underwent a strict lockdown, with no one allowed to leave the premises for a brief period. Phone lines were disconnected and a crowd gathered outside the gates. A note on the bulletin board announced the Queen's passing at 6.30pm, surrounded by her children and grandchildren. The news of her death surprised many, as her reign had been enduring, leaving preparations for her state funeral uncertain. Despite official denials of her illness, Dr James Reed, who attended to Victoria's health for two decades, recognised her impending demise. The cause of Queen Victoria's death has long been debated. While she suffered from rheumatism and poor eyesight, it was a series of strokes after the 17th of January that led to her decline, causing delirium and pain. As her condition worsened, the royal family was summoned to Osborne House, where preparations for her succession were made. Surrounded by her loved ones and clergy, Queen Victoria passed away, leaving behind a legacy that would endure for generations. Prayers and hymns filled the room as Queen Victoria lay on her deathbed, surrounded by her closest family members. Despite her consciousness, her failing eyesight left her unable to see. Each family member kissed her hand and bid their farewells in their own way, while the clerics continued their chants in a futile attempt to rally her. The cause of Victoria's death remains a subject of debate, with some attributing it to a series of strokes that she suffered, while others believe it was simply due to old age and frailty. Regardless, her declining health was evident for some time, marked by her loss of appetite, exhaustion and confusion. Following her passing, confusion arose regarding the planning of her funeral, as her unprecedented reign left no precedent for such arrangements. Despite her expressed wishes against it, a death mask was ordered by Kaiser Wilhelm, and additionally, logistical mishaps such as the forgetting of a coffin and subsequent delays occurred during the transportation of her body to London. Victoria's body was prepared for burial by her doctor and dresser, who refused embalming and instead used charcoal to mitigate odour and moisture. She was dressed in a white silk gown, adorned with symbolic items and sentimental objects were placed inside her coffin, including a lock of hair from her close friend, John Brown. Her funeral procession, marked by military honours and solemn ceremonies, reflected the magnitude of her reign. Finally, as her body was lowered into the vault at Frogmore, both Kaiser Wilhelm II and Edward VII knelt beside her coffin, paying their respects to the woman who once symbolised immense power, but passed away surrounded by her loved ones. The Death of Queen Alexandra The final rites of Queen Alexandra, previously known as Princess Alexandra of Denmark, took place on Friday, 
the 27th of November in 1925 at Westminster Abbey after her passing on the 20th of November that year. She was the widow of King Edward VII and the mother of King George V. Queen Alexandra retained a youthful appearance even in her later years, but the toll of age became evident during the First World War. Her international travels ceased and her health began a gradual decline. In 1920, she suffered from a burst blood vessel in her eye, resulting in temporary partial blindness. Towards the latter part of her life, her memory and ability to communicate became increasingly affected. On the day prior to her demise, reports emerged that Alexandra experienced a seizure around 11am. As the day progressed on the 20th of November, a gathering of her closest family members, including her three daughters, the Queen of Norway, the Princess Royal and Princess Victoria, along with her grandson, Prince Henry, had assembled by 1pm, coinciding with her descent into unconsciousness. Observing her deteriorating condition, medical aid was administered in the form of oxygen by 4.15pm, although her strength continued to wane. At 5.25pm that very day, at Sandringham House, she passed away from a heart attack, a mere 11 days prior to reaching her 81st birthday. Her son, King George V, her daughter-in-law, Queen Mary, and several other members of the royal family were present during her final moments. Subsequently, her two eldest grandsons, the Prince of Wales and the Duke of York, who were en route via train, arrived at 6.45pm. Following the announcement of her death, flags across the nation were lowered to half-mast as a sign of respect, except at Windsor Castle, where the Union Jack remained raised, adhering to the Royal Protocol, which stipulates its descent upon the passing of a reigning sovereign. In a mark of mourning, various entertainment events, including those involving music and dance, were cancelled by numerous West End hotels in London, while the BBC interrupted its usual programming to pay homage to the departed Queen. In a poignant display of national recognition, Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin promptly presented a motion of condolence in the House of Commons, a gesture that received heartfelt agreement from the leader of the opposition, Ramsay MacDonald. Additionally, the Grenadier Guards marched in the Horse Guards Parade, their colours draped in sombre mourning, symbolising the nation's collective grief and respect for the late Queen Alexandra of Denmark. Following Alexandra's passing, a series of poignant ceremonies unfolded, commencing with her remains being initially placed at St Mary Magdalene Church in Sandringham, before being relocated to the Chapel Royale at St James's Palace. A modest yet heartfelt service was conducted at the church in Sandringham, attended by both the royal family and local villagers. Mourners respectfully paid their final respects by filing past the adorned coffin, veiled in her personal banner at arms. The solemn procession commenced in Sandringham, where her coffin, draped in regal emblems, was conveyed to Wolferton Railway Station. In a sombre yet reverential display, the King, the Queen, the Prince of Wales, the Duke of York and a host of mourners solemnly followed the cortege, with estate workers and villagers eventually joining this sad march. In London, a grand procession was orchestrated from St James's Palace to Westminster Abbey. The entire route was adorned with military personnel paying their respects as the gun carriage carrying the coffin traversed key areas like the Mall, Horse Guards Parade and Whitehall. Detachments from various regiments participated, accompanied by poignant gun salutes. The poignant sight of royalty walking and mourning behind the coffin included the king in a field marshal's uniform, along with the kings of Belgium, Denmark and Norway, the Prince of Wales, the Crown Prince of Norway and other royal princes. The Queen, the Queen of Norway, the Queen of Spain and the royal princesses made their way directly to the abbey. Paul bearers were chosen from the King's Company of Grenadiers. The highly ceremonial funeral took place at the Abbey on the 27th of November 1925 at 11.30am, conducted by the Archbishop of Canterbury. The congregation included cabinet members, diplomats and high commissioners. The order of service compromised poignant selections of hymns such as Now the Labourer's Task is Over 
and on the resurrection morning, and the moving anthem, Give Rest, O Christ. Following the formal funeral service, Alexandra lay in state at the Abbey, permitting the public to pay their respects on the 27th of November. Throughout the nation, additional memorial services were conducted in churches, coinciding with the closure of theatres and dance halls in a show of respect. Beyond the Shores Memorial Services in Alexander's honour were also held in Australia at notable cathedrals. Her coffin was later moved to Windsor for a private evening service, joining her late husband's coffin in the Albert Memorial Chapel, where floral tributes were placed for public viewing. As per Alexandra's directives, dating back to 1919, a monument designed by Bertram McKinnell was erected in the South Isle, featuring two effigies of both Alexandra and Edward in white marble atop a black and green marble sarcophagus. The bodies of the royal couple were finally interred two years after Alexandra's demise on the 22nd of April 1927, fulfilling her long-standing wishes. Remarkably, Alexandra's legacy persisted through her great-granddaughter, Princess Elizabeth Alexandra Mary of York, who was christened in homage to the late Queen, becoming Queen Elizabeth II, born just five months after Alexandra's passing. The Death of Queen Mary The final rites for Queen Mary, previously known as Princess Victoria, Mary of Teck, and the widow of King George V, she died just shy of her 86th birthday and a mere 10 weeks before her granddaughter Queen Elizabeth II was to be crowned. During her last year, Queen Mary grappled with profound grief following the death of her son, King George VI, the third of her children to pass away before her. Her health had been deteriorating due to a gastric illness, confining her to her bed for about a month prior to her passing. Reports suggested that in her final month, she seemed to come to terms with the reality of her condition, feeling that she had accomplished her goal of safeguarding the monarchy and accepting that her life was reaching its natural conclusion. She also experienced discomfort from the light in her room, leading to the drawing of the curtains to shield her eyes. On the 24th of March 1953, Mary reportedly suffered a hemorrhage, prompting immediate concern for her health condition. At 11.40am, a bulletin released from Marlborough House addressed these concerns. Subsequently, a second bulletin at 1.40pm detailed a significant deterioration in her state, indicating a severe weakening of her heart function. As the day progressed, updates were issued at 7pm. It was reported that Mary was gradually losing strength, but peacefully resting. Tragically, she passed away in her sleep at Marlborough House at 10.20pm. The official announcement, released at 11.15pm, signed by Sir Horace Evans and Lord Webb Johnson, confirmed her passing. Her daughter, the Princess Royal, was by her side during her final moments. Throughout the day, Mary's children and various members of the royal family, by her side. The Duke of Windsor, her eldest son, had visited her twice that day, and returned to Marlborough House shortly after her passing. Both the Princess Royal and the Duke of Windsor had curtailed their holiday in the United States and the West Indies due to their mother's worsening condition. Her other surviving son, the Duke of Gloucester, her granddaughters, Queen Elizabeth II and Princess Margaret, Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, and additional members of the royal family also paid their respects on her last day. The day following Mary's passing, so a steady stream of royal family members visiting Marlborough House to pay their respects, notably the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh, along with a host of other relatives, gathered to honour her memory. In the midst of this, a spokesperson for the Duchess of Windsor, who hadn't accompanied her husband to Britain, expressed her deep distress at the news of Mary's passing. Reactions to Mary's passing were deeply ceremonial and widespread, the banner of her arms, which flew over Marlborough House, was respectfully lowered following the announcement of her death. Across government buildings and warships in the UK and throughout the British Commonwealth, flags were flown at half-mast as a sign of mourning, remaining so after her funeral. 
At 10.45 p.m., Prime Minister Winston Churchill solemnly informed the House of Commons about her passing. He introduced a motion of condolence, which received support from the Leader of the Opposition. The Federal Parliament of Australia also paid tribute to her legacy. Condolences poured in from various international figures. The King of Sweden, US President, French President, German President and diplomats from the British Commonwealth, among others. The news of her demise prompted an interruption in the BBC programming at 11.25pm. All regular broadcasts were halted, making way for news updates and weather forecasts only. The following day, both courts and the London Stock Exchange held a brief moment of silence before resuming their activities. The Royal Household observed a month-long mourning period until April the 25th. Official engagements involving the royal family were cancelled during this time. Respecting Mary's passing, although the coronation plans for her granddaughter Queen Elizabeth II proceeded as per Mary's express wishes. The location for her funeral shifted due to the preparations for the upcoming coronation, with Westminster Abbey ruled out as the venue. On the 25th of March, the Queen's own rifles of Canada, a regiment of which Mary was the colonel-in-chief, held a solemn parade dedicated to her memory. The ceremony surrounding Mary's passing continued as her coffin was placed at the Queen's Chapel in Marlborough House grounds on the 26th of March. Members of her household stood guard in vigil over her casket. On the 29th of March, the Archbishop of Canterbury presided over a small service at the chapel, attended by the Queen, the Duke of Edinburgh, the Queen Mother and other members of the royal family. Floral tributes from close family members adorned the chapel, signifying their deep respect and affection for Mary. A plaque situated in Westminster Hall marked the significant event of her lying in state. The movement of Mary's coffin from Marlborough House to Westminster Hall commenced on the 29th of March at 2.29pm, following a route extending a mile and a half. Adorned in her personal standard and topped with a wreath from the Queen, the coffin rested on the gun carriage of the King's troop, Royal Horse Artillery. The procession moved from the mall towards the Horse Guards Parade and into Whitehall, traversing streets filled with an assembly of half a million people. The carriage was accompanied by six pallbearers, including colonels from the four regiments with which Mary held a significant connection. Participating in this grand march were units from various military divisions, numbering 210 members, each from the Royal Air Force and the Brigade of Gurkhas, along with 42 from the Household Cavalry and 262 from the Royal Navy and the Royal Marines. The procession included the massed bands of the Brigade of Gurkhas, two footmen, two pages and her steward, all representing Queen Mary's household. The gun carriage, flanked by pallbearers and the Queen's company of the Grenadier Guards, was escorted by a notable figures such as the Duke of Edinburgh, the Duke of Windsor, the Duke of Gloucester, the Duke of Kent, Prince George Valdemar of Denmark, members of the British nobility, high-ranking military officers and representatives from regiments associated with Mary. Throughout the route, military personnel stood in formation with arms reversed, only presenting arms when the gun carriage passed in front of them. The pace of the procession was 80 steps per minute, with gun salutes fired every minute. The entire march lasted 26 minutes, with the coffin arriving at Westminster Hall at 2.55pm. At 3pm, when the coffin was positioned within Westminster Hall, distinguished members of the royal family, including royal dukes, Mary's brother, grandsons and other nobility, stood in solemn respect. The Queen, the Queen Mother, Princess Margaret, the Princess Royal, the Duchesses of Gloucester and Kent, Princess Alexandra and the Countess of Athlone stood on the opposite side. The Grenadier Guards formed the Guard of Honour, while regiments from the Royal Air Force also stood present. An intimate service conducted by the Archbishop of Canterbury took place in the presence of royal family members, government officials and parliament members and their spouses. Her remains were placed in state from March 29th to 31st, 1953, allowing heads of states and nearly 120,000 mourners to pay their respects as they passed by her coffin. 
The vigil at her coffin was also shared by the Duke of Windsor and the Duke of Gloucester. On the morning of the 31st of March 1953, Mary's remains were transported by car from London to Windsor at 5am. They were then taken to the Albert Memorial Chapel in preparation for a procession within the grounds of Windsor Castle towards St George's Chapel. Mourners departed from London Paddington Station to board a special train heading to Windsor for the funeral. The coffin, borne by six military pallbearers selected from regiments associated with Mary, was brought into St George's Chapel. It was solemnly carried through the Great East Door at 11am. The procession was led by Captain Arthur Padgent, Lord Claude Hamilton, the Hon John Coke, who carried Mary's insignia and chivalric orders, and the Lord Chamberlain, following were a host of notable figures including the Duke of Edinburgh, the Duke of Windsor, the Duke of Gloucester and the Duke of Kent. During the funeral service, attended by 1,500 mourners, conducted by the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Dean of Windsor, hymns like Abide With Me and Glorious Things of These Are Spoken were sung. The coffin was then lowered to the royal vault as the Queen sprinkled earth from Frogmore three times onto her grandmother's coffin marking the Archbishop's declaration of her transition to eternal life. This was followed by the pronouncement, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. The service concluded with the recital of Dead March. After the ceremony, members of the public were allowed on the castle grounds to pay their respects and view the floral tributes. Simultaneously, a memorial service at St Paul's Cathedral, attended by 4,000 individuals, was held. Mary's body was laid to rest in the royal vault before being interred next to her husband, King George V, in the north nave aisle of St George's Chapel, beneath a significant tomb effigy sculpted by Sir William Reed Dick. In August 1953, it was revealed that through the principal probate registry records that Mary had left an estate valued at £379,864 in her will, later assessed at £406,407.